would you, in celebration of this odd time that we have on Sunday morning where we get together and raise our hands and sing, would you, in celebration of the uh, availability to this kind of community, just greet one another this morning, hug, shake hands, be happy with one another. Jeff's going to play some music, and then in a minute, someone will bring you back with some announcements, okay? Greet one another. There is someone here that's giving announcements this morning. Who's giving announcements this morning? Is there someone here giving announcements this morning? Is that, who is it? It's Jan. Jan's giving announcements this morning. Would you guys welcome Jan this morning? Welcome Jan. <laughs> welcome Jan. And after Jan has her announcements, I've got my own. You're welcome. Uh, in this church, we're, we're um, it's a new church, uh, and we've been meeting here at Lions Field. We started once a month, Easter Sunday of last year, and I was really scared. And I didn't know uh, what was going on. And during that time that we've had church, we had church up north, and, and there are people that are part of the church, and then they left. Uh, moved to Virginia, and then some other people came along, and then they left because we moved down here, and for other reasons. And, and it's hard as a pastor. I want to share with you, because what happens in church is that we come into relationship with one another, we invest in one another's lives, and because as a pastor we've sort of given up our whole lives for this, our Lena and I, and even the kids. Um, we sense a sort of investment in what we're doing that is life and death. And it's, it's very deep and, and heavy for us. So when Jennifer Olliman came up to me and said, hey, how do I join the church? I about broke down into tears. Because there was a sense of, are you serious? Are you, sh are you sure? <laughs> There's an engagement in church life. And in many churches, they call it membership. And that's fine, and that's appropriate. Membership says something, I guess, right? You can be a member of so many different things. I don't like what it means. I, don't, I just don't like the word. Mostly because I can't turn, what is that? Is it a noun? Is it an adverb? Is it, what is it? Membership. Thank you. I can't turn that into a verb by changing the letters. In, 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 my, in my experience, I don't see people mem very often. It's not a word. So when we thought about, thanks to Jennifer, because I, my mind wasn't even there. I was like, church must survive. Don't know how to survive. And Jennifer's like, how do I join the church? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> we went through a process of saying, how is it that we want people to belong? How is it that we say that we share what's going on in the church together? And so we came up with this terminology called active partnership. I want to be an active partner in the church. And we went through the values and the vision of the church. We said, what does it mean for someone to actually be an active par partner in our mission and vision and values? And so we tried to articulate our, our mission better, to invite our community to welcome Jesus into all of life. That's our mission. But then our vision was coming up. God was doing something in our, in our vision this year to be a kingdom of priests for the kingdom of God. That's our vision. That our church would be a kingdom of priests for the kingdom of God. If you can imagine, like, priests going around town, and all they're doing is being priests, a kingdom of them, priesting people. <laughs> Whatever priesting means in the best sense of the word, you know, just going up to them, sharing their burdens, offering all of their stuff to God with them. To be a kingdom of priests for the kingdom of God, doing our mission, which is inviting our community to welcome Jesus into all of life. So to be an active partner in that, what would that mean? Well, it would mean doing the purposes of the church. And the church has many purposes. Uh, we articulate them. If, you ever, if you're curious about anything that I'm saying, there's a little card like this on the table. But we worship together. 
We share together. We serve one another. We apprentice. That, that's, a, that's a word for discipleship if you've heard that in churches. Apprentice. We pray. Those are the purposes of the church. For us, it's doing the stuff that makes you an active partner. Does that make any sense? It's not signing a document. It's being an active partner. Doing the stuff. So we made up these cards that just say, this is my church. And if people wanted to sign them, that'd be great. For me, it's not about someone writing on a line like this. If you decide to start dating someone, for instance, you don't have a document. Some people do, I guess. I... You have a marriage license. And so, and so for a marriage license, it's a deeper sense of relationship, isn't it? where a commitment and an intimacy level has grown to a sense. And so we do have a leadership document, actually, that people sign. Because they're, they've come into the church to the degree that we have some expectations together, that this is what this means. But in, in a sense, we say, this is my church. We offer people to say this, to be able to articulate this, as if we're growing together in natural relationship, which is actually what happens in the church. When people leave... I don't feel like they've just unsigned a document. When people leave, whether it's on good or bad terms, I feel like I've lost someone in my life. That's real. And so we engage in this way, not in membership, but in active partnership together, where people get to say, I'm a follower of Jesus, which just means I've come into the body of the church. They've been baptized in doing that. And they want to do the stuff of the kingdom of God, inviting others to do the same. They encourage the church with their time, energy, and finances towards the mission and vision of Mission Vineyard Church. They want to be an active partner to help Mission Vineyard grow into the church that God has in mind. We did this because relationships need clear articulation of expectations. That's all. But we don't do membership as a way for people to sign and say, I'm a member. We have this because this is real. This is real relationship. When someone like Jennifer says, how do I become a part of the church? It doesn't mean that she's just on a roll somewhere. It means that she's taken up part of the cross that Jesus has given our church, the mission and vision, the values and the purposes. It's an active partnering with one another. That makes me weep when people say yes. It's a big deal for me because it's something that we've given our lives for. If that's you, I want you to stand this morning. And I want to bless you right now because this is no small step for me. You are going out together in a way that invites our community to welcome Jesus into all of life by being a kingdom of priests for the kingdom of God, and you're doing the stuff. Would you receive a blessing right now? God, these people that have stood up, I don't know what to do with them, God. But you do. So I ask right now, in the name of Jesus, that you would bless and anoint them for the work of this church. that you would join with them in their stuff and that they would go out and do the stuff of your kingdom. God, that through this church and through the hands that are out right now, that you would heal people in Jesus' name. That you would restore people in Jesus' name. That you would bring people out of poverty. That you would deliver them from demons. That you would deliver them from all kinds of broken relationship. That you would restore their lives and bless them in ways that they couldn't comprehend. God, would you honor their commitment today? God, if there's anything that you've done in our Lita and I, I ask that you would take a part of it and give it to them. Thank you. 
impart to them, God, this spirit of church planting, of evangelism, of excitement, God, for your heart for this community, impart it to them. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Receive Him. He is your lifeblood, your advocate, your, your everything. To do the work of your life and the work of this church. Receive this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. It's no small thing. And for anybody else that's here, thank you for this time, for allowing me to just have this. It's important for me. Okay. I'm going to switch gears. You ready? I'm switching gears. I'm in a Porsche 911, and the gear shifts are changed. They're, they're quick. You don't get this analogy if you don't understand what I'm talking about. Um, if you're curious about any of this stuff, again, these documents are over there. It's about belonging. It's not about binding. It's about being and doing. Thank you, God. Today, I want to show you a video. It's 15 minutes long. It's the, one of the vineyard churches in Oklahoma City taking risk. Today is all about hearing the voice of God for other people. And here's my heart. That we would be a church that does this kind of stuff in more extreme ways and less, in more natural and more spiritual. My hope is that as we talk today, and we'll talk, we'll, we'll debrief a little bit about 15 minutes after, we'll engage a little bit what it means to hear God's voice for other people. But I wanted to, you to see this video first. Um, yeah, I want you to see that first. So here we go. Our job isn't to bring ministry. Our job is to simply look for God's activity, listen for his direction, and respond in obedience. CV, I mean, uh, Walgreens, get my prescriptions filled, and I was sitting in the car, and the young man asked me, where was I hurting on my left side? And I said, yes, and he asked me, could he pray for me for the pain? And I said, yes. So he came over and he prayed for me the first time, and I could move my arm. I couldn't move it up way up like that at first. And then he said, you still in pain? I said, yes, my legs are still hurting. So he prayed for me about my legs. And I got up and I walked into the drugstore and I couldn't hardly get up. I had to have my sister to go on the drugstore for me. But I didn't walk in there and I'm back out, getting ready to go and thank you, Lord. What happened? To, what did you feel come on your body when we prayed for you? It was like a tingling. Like a tingling? On my left side. And all the pain completely left? Yes, it did. And on the scale of 1 to 10, what would you say your pain level was before we started praying? It was, it was I think it was like 9, 8 or 9. It just hurt real bad. Real bad. And you haven't been able to walk like this for how long? For a long time, years. Come on. No, All for right. real. Awesome show. Hey, look at you walk. <laughs> Have a great day. Uh, I got fibromyalgia and RA, rheumatoid arthritis. And I haven't been able to bend my knees in like a long, long time. And now I can bend. Now you can bend. What, can bend. what kind of pain level were you on a scale of one to ten? Eight. An eight. Yes. And now show me all the things you can you can do now that you I couldn't do. And, I bend. and what happened when we prayed for you? When I prayed for y'all, prayed for me. I had like a numbness and tingling come out of my body. I felt it all over my body. And by the grace of God, I'm okay. Is that awesome? <laughs> God is so good, isn't he? Yes, he is. Amen. One second. Tell me your name. 
Josephine. And Josephine, as I pulled up to the window, I asked if you had a condition in your neck and your back. And what'd you say? I said I had uh, pain in my neck and my back. On a scale of 1 to 10, Timmy, the worst, what'd you say your pain level was? About a 9. And as I prayed for you, what happened? It went away. No more pain? No more pain. Can you believe that? Yeah. <laughs> That's just the goodness and love of God for you, isn't it? That's pretty amazing. Thanks for sharing your testimony. Okay. So, and I had problems with my knee, my back, and my chest. And as soon as they prayed for me, my knee felt a little numb. My chest, it felt a little, like I had a little pop in it. It just felt real weird. <laughs> And so, so we were just out shopping, just getting some toys for my, my two little boys. And uh, as we were shopping, I asked you, I said, do you have, happen to have problems in your uh, yeah, chest, just asked your back? Yeah, just out of nowhere after I got through helping, just, it was crazy. In your knee. <laughs> and then it we prayed crazy. for you. And you said you've had pain in your right knee for how long? Since July. Since July. Mm -hmm. And it's been a constant pain on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst. Nine. A nine. And all of a sudden we prayed. You said you felt a pop in your chest mm -hmm. from the asthma that yeah. you were feeling. And then the, your knee just went numb. You felt like you were going to fall over. Mm -hmm. And then... Seriously. It's crazy. And there's no more pain. <laughs> no more. Like, there's no more pain. Like, I don't even have to use my inhaler right now. Wow. You know what that was? What? That's the goodness and love of God for you. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Uh, I can't wait till I go home and tell my fiance about that. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Kelly, mm -hmm. so what happened to you? What what was going on? I, I walked up in the store and I asked you if there was something going on with your neck and your back. Yes. Yeah, how long have you been having a problem with your neck and your back? For a long time. Yeah. On a scale of one to ten, ten being the worst, what would you say your pain level was? Ten. Ten? And so we prayed for you, what happened? It, it, it relieved everything. What did you feel come on your body? Like, just like a lot of pressure just went away. You said you, said you felt like a tingling? Tingling. And a, like a warmth, warmth come over your back? Yes. And you've had a back condition for how long? Um, it's been a while. How long is a while? A few months? A, years. A few years. Mm -hmm. And how long has it been that you've been without pain in a few years? long time like every day that you're in pain or is it mm -hmm. so this is the first time you've been without pain mm -hmm. in over a year mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you think about that that's good that's pretty awesome huh yeah. so what's your name my name's Jeanette hi Brother Jeanette hi. I'm Brian hi Brian so I came up to you and asked you if you had any problem like in your in your neck and your, your back and you said you had problems in your lower back and how long have you been having that problem in your lower back Oh gosh, years? Years. I asked you on the uh, scale from one to ten, ten being the worst. What do you? What would you rate your pain today at? Well, because I've dealt with it for so long, and I just kind of have gotten used to it, and just eight. I said today. Yeah. And so when I prayed for you, what happened? What did you feel? When you prayed for me, Brian. Yeah. It took everything I had to just continue to stand. I mean, we're standing here in Walmart. First of all, I was amazed that somebody would just come up to me and pray for me in a public place, which is awesome. Uh, secondly, when you prayed, it, it was like, it took everything I had to keep standing. And I mean, my back, I have not felt this good. And then when you prayed, not only did he touch and heal my back, as I was expressing to you, uh, I had a really heavy spirit, and all of a sudden, I just feel so uplifted. I feel so encouraged again. I feel so, you know, hey, it's, it's going to be okay. God's still in control. Come on, Jesus. That's it amazing. Was awesome. You said you felt like a heat or something, right, that came in your body, or what? It was like it was like a heat that went into my back, and, and in my mind, it was going like a ping pong ball just across my back, like that. I had to, like, with everything I had, just continue to stand. Otherwise, I would have been. <laughs> and so, there's no more pain at all in your no. back. Come on, Jesus. That's God amazing. Thank you for sharing your testimony. You're welcome. Thank you for, for, for letting God use you mm -hmm. in a public place. That's what we're supposed to do. That's Absolutely. followers of Jesus. Amen.
Hi, my name is Mary Robinson, and I had got prayed by Brian and the rest of his praying crew that was down here, and I got prayed for for my eyes, my ears, my back, my pain, my diabetes, and all of that. Oh man, God is awesome! Awesome! My face is not hurt no more. My eyes cleared up the same day they prayed. I mean, God is good. Now, what do you mean by your eyes being cleared up? What was happening? With blurry. Your eyes? Your blurry. eyes were blurry. Blurry. And yeah. they're blurry from what? From my sugar being high. And Your my sugar being high. And they gritty. Very yeah. gritty. And so there's like, just like a, a blurriness when you would look at things, You could, everything was out of focus? A little out of focus, but you feel the grits, like grits in your eyes. Like yeah. Like sand. Like, like, sand. like, like sand. sand. And that's all cleared up. Yes. And, 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 you're, and things aren't blurry anymore. No, no, no. Come on. No, 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 and then you no. said something about your back? Yes. What was wrong with your back? Oh, my back would hurt. Every morning I get up in the mornings, it would hurt. But it don't hurt no more. Come it on, Jesus. Hurt. It don't hurt. It don't hurt. I can be in. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, that was last week. So that's been over no, a week. That was, that was last, last week. Last, last, last week. Tuesday. That was a week ago. A week ago tonight. That's right. That's right. That's and there's right. no more pain. No more pain. No more blurriness. No more blurriness. Come on, Jesus. <laughs> Move it around. Let's see it. Let's see it. Does it hurt you more? Come on. Come on. And it doesn't. Is that a pretty while? Yeah. Yeah. Right there. So, Sarah, you were in the car, and we were praying for, is this your dad? My dad. Your dad. And we had prayed for you a couple of weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago. And you have the COPD. I have COPD. And I had a pain when I came out of this building. I had a pain in my chest. Yeah. And uh, you prayed for me a couple of weeks ago, and the pain was about a half hour, half hour after you prayed. I was going in the car, you know. Yes. The pain was going down, 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 and, and it's been away. It's been that way. And it hasn't been, has not come back. This no, has been only my uh, breathing. You know, only your breathing. My yes. COPD, you know, it's yes. still there. That's still there. Yeah. But the pain left. Yeah. Yes. And so as we were talking to you, the Lord gave me a, a word of knowledge about a problem. I know, that was so weird because your shoulder. I, I have not told anybody about yeah. it. And then you came out, we prayed for you. Uh -huh. And then what happened as we were praying for you? I felt like a little, like something in here. And then uh, when you prayed again, it just went away. <laughs> I was like, oh like my Like a bed bug in there, you know. Yeah. 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 In there. <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> I've never felt that before. That's just the love of God. Just the love of God for both of you. Amen. And we're praying completely for your dad to oh, get yeah. completely healed from this. Oh, yeah. And this thing to be crushed. Oh, yeah. yeah. Maybe next yes. time I won't carry this. That's right. All right, so tell us your name. I'm Cheryl Wyatt. Hi, Cheryl. Now, what was going on with you? You had a 10-level pain? Yes. And then show me what you can do now after we prayed for you. I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> and you couldn't do that before. I can do this, but not without hurting. No, without hurting. <laughs> and you've had pain in your back backside for since when? 1998. Since, since 1998. You've been in pain? Yes. Like every single day in pain? Yes. I've been going to different doctors, and they've been uh, saying that I need surgery. I went to a <laughs> but you know, but I can do things that I couldn't normally do. <laughs> <laughs> and you couldn't do that before. I can do this, but not without hurt. No, without hurt. Tell me your name. Gustavo Torres. And Gustavo, what, what happened to you? Uh, yeah, you had pain in your leg? Yeah. And you've been having pain for how long has he been having pain Two for? Two or three years. Two or three years. And it's from, what, diabetes? Yes. And so he said, it, on a scale from uh, one to ten, he said it was about an eight-level pain. Is yes, that correct? Sometimes worse. And sometimes worse. And so, as we prayed for him, you just felt the pain go away. Did you feel any warmth or tingling, or what happened? So, like a little bit of tingling. Like a little bit of tingling and then all the pain left? Mm -hmm. And this is the first time without pain in how many? About three years. About two to three years mm -hmm. is what you said. Yeah. That's amazing. Show us what you can do with now with your leg. 
Can you bend down? Wow. And you know, you know why? Do you know why that happened? That's the love of Jesus for you. Because he loves us so much. Thank you for sharing. So your name is Jordine? Yes. And Jordine, you have been in some kind of condition or pain for how long? About three, four years. Three, four years. What's the condition that you have? That's arthritis in my knees. Arthritis in your knees. And I see you have a cane. Yes. And on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst, what was your pain level? Between 7 and 8. 7 and 8. And uh, we prayed for you. And what happened? It's not tingly, but it was like, you know, warm. Uh-huh. Warm in, in my knees. And then did the and pain, what well, did the pain start to dissipate? Yeah, uh, when we prayed again, when you we prayed again, and then it, you know, just warm. Uh-huh. And when I walk with a cane, I'm usually, you know, yeah. limping to the, to the right. And I've never walked straight for a long, long time. And so how long has it been that you've walked without a cane? Well, since I, the arthritis started about three, four years, it's about around that. You want to show me what you can do now without the cane? Yeah, well, you can just walk to me. Oh. <laughs> so you have not been able to do that for how long? Like I said, about three, four years. Three or four years without a cane. Yeah, that's when it started hurting. And you always use walk to the. Yeah. You know that this is just the amazing love of God for you. He loves you so much, and the same thing that He did with your knees, He wants to do with your heart and your whole life, because Jesus loves us so much. Isn't that awesome? Because you, you you felt what happened to you. You went up, you fell off where? Okay, now you put this on you. It, it's slamming, you know? it's slamming back to earth. Wow. So what couldn't you do before? You can't, can you, can you bend down now? in the Bible. Isn't that weird? It's in the Bible. And Jesus does this all over the place. And then the disciples do this all over the place when they're filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't do it so often because I'm afraid. Isn't that silly? I get distracted as well. So I'm afraid sometimes and I'm distracted. I'm distracted sometimes by fear and I'm distracted sometimes by my own stuff because I want to hear God for my stuff so much that I get distracted to hearing God for other people. So I get distracted and I'm afraid. But the Bible doesn't say anything about that. Let me tell you what the Bible says. This is Acts 20, this is Acts 8, verse 26. I don't know if you have any of these. You have them up. I can't believe you have them up. Jeff is like 
last minute man, esprit de corps. I don't know what I just said. Yeah, I don't, I have no idea. I said something, not in French, I'm sure. This is Acts. As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, okay, so he's hearing God's voice for other people, and an, God used an angel to speak to him. The angel said, go south, down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch, great authority, under the Kandake, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and he was now returning, seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet of Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, now the Holy Spirit speaking to Philip, go over and walk beside the carriage. So Philip is now hearing the voice of God for someone else. We getting this? Philip ran over, so he was obedient. Good job, Philip. Ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked, do you understand what you're reading? The man replied, how can I, unless someone instructs me, and he urged Philip to come up to the carriage and sit with him. It was a simple question by Philip. You understand what you're saying? It was a simple question from the Holy Spirit, a simple question from the angel. But step by step, he was obedient. And all of a sudden, he's sitting next to the treasurer of Ethiopia, talking to him about Isaiah. The passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb is silent. This is a messianic verse. It's about Jesus. And as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from earth. This is the Holy Spirit already speaking to the treasurer through the scriptures in Isaiah about Jesus the Messiah, but he couldn't understand it. And so the Holy Spirit and an angel spoke to Philip so that he would. Here we go. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? Why would the treasurer think that the prophet was talking about someone else? Unless the Holy Spirit was urging him to do that. God is already at work. He's already at work. So, beginning with the same scripture, Philip told the good news about Jesus. As they rode along, that he came, they came upon some water, and the eunuch said, Look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? This is the Holy Spirit on the treasure of Ethiopia getting spurred to be baptized. He ordered the carriage to, shut, to stop, and they went down to the water, and Philip baptized them. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. <laughs> The eunuch never saw him again, and he went away on his way rejoicing. Meanwhile, Philip found himself farther north at the town of Azotus, and he preached the good news there and every town along the way until he came to Caesarea. If there's anything in the Bible that I want Jesus to do with me that he did in the Bible, I want to go like and in, in, in travel in space. <laughs> I think that would be super fun. If just like in a minute, like I'm talking to you about Jesus, and then we're done, you're all baptized and stuff, and then God just goes, Poof, and I'm in like Africa or whatever, and just hanging out with other people talking about Jesus. I think that would be super fun. There's a step of obedience here. The obedience comes from other scripture, though. This is Jesus, and he says to his disciples in Matthew 16, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways. Take up your cross. Follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, give up your distractions for yourself, give up your fear to talk to other people. If you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is there anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels and the glory of the Father and will judge all the people according to their deeds. And I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the Son of Man coming in the kingdom. He's coming soon. And he's asking us to give up our lives now, not when he comes later, because he's at work now. The step of obedience that Philip knew very well was to give up his life and to begin to listen for what the kingdom of God was up to. And it happened to be with the treasure of Ethiopia. 
Paul talks about this. This is Romans 10. For Moses writes, the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of his commands. But faith's way of getting right with God says, don't say in your heart who will go up to heaven. Don't start questioning religious stuff. I just encourage you. If someone starts talking about, well, who's going to go to hell and who's not? The Bible says not to worry about that in so many different ways. And here's Paul telling you. Don't start arguing about who's going to heaven and who's not. Start doing the stuff. We will get so bogged down sometimes by minutia that we don't do anything to be a part of what God is doing. So this is Paul. Don't say in your heart who's going to go up to heaven. Don't say who'll go down to the place of the dead. In fact, it says the message is very close at hand, and it is on your lips and in your heart. If you are, all, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you've given up your life for him, ask for the Holy Spirit. Be baptized. I tell you, his message will be on your heart. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. How many times have I gone up to someone? It was even this week. I was so timid. There was a woman at Starbucks, and it just she caught my eye, and I felt like God had given me this elaborate scheme of all that was going on in her life. But I said, God, if her name's not Denise, like you told me to, I'm not going on with this. It wasn't Denise. So she laughed at me. And I went back to my book. But I want to tell you something. Anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile, they're same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him unless they believe in him? How can they believe in him unless they, they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? How will anyone go without hearing his voice to be sent? To be sent means someone is sending you. That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. These people, you can imagine, had a much easier experience believing that one, God was real, two, that God loved them, and three, that he would love them for the rest of his life, that they could trust their lives with him because of the supernatural experience they had with the love of God. Some people like to argue. And that's fine. That's their temperament. They want to argue about the scriptures. They want to argue that faith is bad. They want to talk to you about all the horrible things that's happened in the last 2,000 years because of Christendom. Good for you. I don't want to go there half the time. If you want to talk about it, I can talk about it. I just feel like I'm wasting time because at the end of the day, what I want you to know is that God loves you and that no matter what has happened in history, with you or with the rest of the earth, that God still wants to love you right now. In fact, let's get everyone else out of the way, and I want you to experience God not through my words, but through his personal touch on your life. You want to break through the minutia of arguing about faith. Let God touch someone. But that means getting away from the fear, getting away from the distraction, actively listening to God, and then risking that her name might be Denise. If I felt bolder, if I knew I wasn't on a time crunch, I would have pursued it more. Some of you just have friends that you know you need to call. I had a friend call me. Well, he Facebook messaged me, and I said, no, we're talking about this important corporate stuff going on in his life, needed to hear God's voice. And so I said, okay, let's pray. 
And during the prayer, he said, no, I just heard it. I'm good. I said, okay, great. Did I need to have an answer? No. Did I need to feel like I was equipped to even be there with him? To tell him about how to manage his directorship in their huge multi-million billion dollar company? No. I needed to be there and hear God's voice with him, for him, and trust that God was going to speak and touch him personally, and he did. We've been talking about hearing the voice of God, and so we focused on ourselves a little bit because we've got a lot of stuff in us that can be distracting. We focused a lot on that stuff. Today, I want to let you know that, yes, God wants to speak to you personally, wants to touch you personally, wants to share you his love personally because he loves you that much. He wants to be in real and deep relationship with you not just through the scriptures, but through the scriptures and personally. Not just through your friends, but through your friends and personally. Not just through worship, but through worship and personally. He wants to know you, not just with your head, but with your heart. Not just with your ears and your mouth, but with your whole body. He wants to know you. And then he wants others to know him too. How cool to see someone who never felt the presence of the voice of God in their lives before ever have their lives changed because of a simple risk of what? Being laughed at? Being rejected? What's my fear about that's keeping me from being with someone so that God could speak to them personally and touch their lives? Some people would go to school for years and years and years to be a nurse or a doctor or a lawyer or a banker to help people in those ways. But they won't risk the fear of walking up to somebody in a grocery store for one moment and trust that without equipment, without anything, just being a tangible asset of God. That their lives can be changed in deeper ways. They've all been treated for diabetes. You saw them. They've all been to the doctor for their back. Okay, and let's encourage people to go to counselors and go to doctors. Let's encourage people to get whole healing from every direction they can. And... Let's allow God to break through and show his love. On your campus, in your workplace, at the drugstore that you frequent, whatever. You've seen people a couple of times. There was a couple of guys, we went out to some playground burger place like they have because we have got kids. And the week before we had been to a different playground burger place and there was a couple of guys with a kid that we had seen the last time that we were out. And so I went up to them and said, this is weird, but I've seen you before. They went, yes, yes, we saw you too. And I said, I really liked your, I wanted to be your friend last time. I overheard your conversation. It was really fun. And we got into a discussion. I just said, listen, typically I would say, is there any way that I can pray for you? How can I pray for you? And just allow God to engage. Maybe if I got an oppression, there would be something there. But for these guys, I just want to say, hey, I'm a pastor. I just want to invite you to our church. I want to be there for you if you guys need anything. It doesn't have to be anything except for what God wants to do in that moment. That, that means that we need to be listening. We need to be listening not to the voice of, well, I don't know what I can do for them, or they live too far away from me, or I don't know where they live, or I don't know where their faith is. They could be another faith. I don't know. Instead of hearing that voice, hearing the voice of God, which says, go and love them. And the one thing that I know that God is saying to you right now and to them, the other, is that I love you so much. And I've loved you so much for so many years. And I love you so much that I sent my son to die for you so that you could have abundant, eternal life. We don't have to offer anything except for the one thing that we know is so true because we experienced it ourselves. And we've already responded, right? Some of us have already responded and said yes to Jesus. But if you haven't, we want to give you that opportunity this morning. 
Would you stand with me? In just a moment, Michael and Jan, they're going to come and give us some instructions on this. But we offer this very tangible time of receiving Jesus in a tangible way by taking communion or the Eucharist at the Lord's table. We call it the Lord's table, Jesus' table. He prepares it. All you have to do is come and receive and say, yes. Yes, Jesus, I want more of you. Yes, Jesus, I want you to rule and reign in my life. Yes, Jesus, I want to hear your voice. Yes, Jesus, I believe and trust you for my life. It's a risk. But we take that chance every week here because we like risking. We like risking our lives to Jesus. And at the end of the day, it's not that big of a risk. And the reward is well worth it. Would you guys come and, and give us some instructions?